Hello, my awesome project managers. I hope you're doing awesome today. We're going to be speaking about the CAPM exam. It is becoming a very popular exam. And one of the great things about the CAPM exam is that you can actually take this exam right there in the comfort of your home. If you've got a camera that can stay focused on you for three hours, remote proctoring is an option and that makes it a very attractive examination. So the main purpose of our meeting today is to talk about the CAPM exam, all things CAPM, and this video will end up being your one-stop shop for CAPM exam kickoff for you to get some traction and begin to move towards your CAPM exam success. So I'm just about getting ready to jump into a CAPM training. I should show you the horrendous looking temperatures behind me outside. All that white stuff you're seeing right there, that is snow, snow covering that parking lot. I wonder how I'm gonna make it out this morning. <laughs> with this horrendous weather. But anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about the CAPM exam right now. And I intend giving you some guidelines and some motivation to get you rolling along to success. So at a very high level, the CAPM certification will test your knowledge on the PMBOK guide. So you do need to read that book called the PMBOK guide. 756 pages in the sixth edition. Other editions differ. So if you're watching this in 2022, 2023, well, of course, there's going to be a new PMBOK guide, most likely by that time period. But if you're watching when it's based on the sixth edition, it's a 756 page book. My recommendation to you is get it electronically so that like me, you can read it on the go and on the move. It will help you. The PMI is the body behind this exam, and the PMI has a very high level of quality when it comes to these exams. Steps are taken to make sure the most reliable testing measures are used in a, as, as an assessment of you. Um, the PMI have taken caution to ensure factors like this don't affect the outcome of the interview, like an interviewer being biased in one way or another, the PMI have removed that. So there's no human contact per se on the exam. It's pretty much a knowledge based exam. And this is how the CAPM is different from the PMP. The CAPM is a knowledge based exam. It's really just knowledge. It's less the application of the knowledge. It's more of the knowledge. Now, these are two different things. Don't get me wrong. A lot of times people think, oh, I'm a PMP, so I know more. It doesn't necessarily mean you know more, see? It just means that you're able to better apply the things you do know. All right, so I'm gonna um, start this off one more time because it appears we had a, a camera glitch in the beginning. So why don't we get started? I'm gonna hit the record button. So once again, good morning, fellow project managers. Those of you who are thinking of taking the CAPM exam, it's a pleasure to have you here today. And I just want to explain to you really quick some things that will help you get CAPM certified. First of all, the CAPM is a knowledge test. Second of all, the PMI have taken steps to ensure that the human variability factors are cut out of this process in that there is no human contact during the examination. It's you versus the exam, pretty much. It is a knowledge-based exam, like I said, and the PMI will be examining your knowledge. They'll be examining your testing competence, putting you in a 150-question test within three hours. Now, this exam is based on the Project Management Body of Knowledge Guide, 756 pages at the moment. And that size could vary as time evolves. What does the CAPM offer? Well, I'll give you a straight up example. A student of mine took my class in 2010 
got CAPM certified, started working in a government agency. And before I could say Jack, she had risen to a very, very prominent position in project management. She did not take the PMP exam, but she was doing great things with a CAPM. So it shows you the CAPM is all about the knowledge. It's up to you to demonstrate that you can apply the knowledge when you get into the real world. And that's what this student of mine did. So the CAPM certification offers recognition to practitioners who are interested in project management or just starting their career. The certification denotes that the individual possesses the knowledge in the principles and terminology. And that's the key thing, the knowledge. So this will test your knowledge. And don't get me wrong, testing knowledge is different from testing the application of knowledge. So you could be a PMP and yet not have as much knowledge about the PMBOK guide compared to someone else. In fact, you may find some PMPs may not do as well on the CAPM exam, believe it or not, because it is a knowledge test front and center. If you know the PMBOK guide really well on the CAPM, you're likely to pass and do well. Now, if you know some pieces and concepts of the PMBOK guide and you're able to apply them really well, or you're able to take whatever question you're given and break it down to a pragmatic application without necessarily being pinpoint precise in the knowledge, you might find some of those students could do better on the PMP. So application of the knowledge you have versus the knowledge itself are two different things. If you have copious knowledge on the CAPM, you'll do great. And that's why you do need to be a master of the PMBOK guide for the CAPM, not just the PMP. You see, both exams are different beasts. And I know this firsthand because I've taken the PMP exam and I've taken the CAPM exam twice. I took the CAPM in 2011. I took it again in 2016 because every five years you need to renew it. So take it from me, this exam is not a cakewalk. You don't have the knowledge, you're gonna fall flat. You do have the knowledge, you'll do awesome. So this knowledge can be applied to on the job experiences that help develop growing levels of competence in the practice of project management. And individuals who carry the CAPM after their name enjoy a high level of credibility. So I told you, my student got certified and rose to high ranks in project management without the PMP, you can do the same. This is a cycle of life of CAPM certification. You've got 90 days to complete the application once you start. The application completeness review is shorter than that of the PMP, kind of like 24 hours. And then you could be audited. If you are audited, you have 90 days to send your audit material. You cannot schedule the exam until you've paid. So you pay and they give you a one year window to sit for the exam. Like I said, you can take the exam in the comfort of your home, just like that. Just like I am here right now. If I wanted to take the cab M, if I was eligible, the touch of a button and boom, I'm taking the exam. So online proctoring is used in this exam where the person applying desires to go that route. Otherwise, you could go to a Prometric test center, take it there. The technology is now on them. You take the risk away from yourself. Now we're going into chapter 11 in the PMBOK guide. <laughs> if you know the PMBOK guide, you probably know that's a transfer strategy. Anyway, then you get into your certification cycle, your five-year cycle. Like I told you, I have been through this cycle. So at the end of five years, from 2011 to 2016, my first wave of, of CAPM uh, lasted me till 2016. And now from 2016 to 2021, my second wave of CAPM. So I've got um, approximately, wow, just two more years and then I'll be taking it again. Unbelievable. But anyway, that's how the cycle works. How much does it cost? Well, if you are a member of the PMI, just bear in mind, it will cost you some money. So it will cost you $139. If you've never been a member before to renew, it will cost you 129. So it's gonna be 139 
plus this, really, if you decide to be a member. If you do the maths, it's actually less being a non-member, but there are some additional costs for the PMBOK guy, the project management body of knowledge that the exam is based on. If you wanted an electronic copy, you got to pay $65 or so. So it makes sense to be a member if you want an electronic copy of the PMBOK guide, which I would recommend. I've got one right here on my tablet. Okay, and uh, like I said, non-members pay more and they don't get the PMBOK guide. No PMBOK, no PDF PMBOK. No PMBOK PDF, that's not the best. You will get a, a PDF copy if you are a member. And the PDF copy is invaluable. I can't count how many times I'm on a plane, I'm on a train, I'm on the road. Question comes up, I can refer to my PMBOK guide anyway. So it is a good thing to have that. Now, before we uh, get towards the end of this, let me let you know we're going to be going full throttle through the entire CAPM syllabus very quickly. So I'm going to be reviewing the CAPM exam content outline. If you have questions about the CAPM, you can feel free to drop them in the chat box. I'm going to go check the chat and see if there's any chats. So if you've got questions, you can always ask those questions, okay? Quick check shows me we do not have any questions right now. But don't hesitate to send any questions about the CAPM exam, anything you're not clear about, I'll be more than happy. And it's gonna help other people who need to get this done as well, okay? So short intermission, two second intermission, I'll be right back. All right, we are back. So let's take a look at the next thing the CAPM eligibility, how do you know you're eligible for the CAPM exam? This is twofold. Either you've got a high school diploma and 1500 hours of professional experience on a project team, or you've got a high school diploma and 23 hours of formal education. Now you might say, Phil, I've got neither of those. I've got a high school diploma but I do not have the 1500 hours. That's fine, just go with that. And if you say, oh, I don't have that, I provide training for this. So to find the training I provide, you wanna to go to this website, it's praiseon.com. And those are eyes, praiseon.com, P-R-A-I-Z-I-O-N.com, go there. And on the second layer down, you're gonna see the training that I provide for this certification. Um, if you are without training at this time, don't fret, we help you out. So the training for this, let me just give you a quick idea of how long that will take you. A lot of folks spend upwards of six weeks to six months to get prepared for this certification. So just keep that in mind. There are some folks who are extremely quick and before you know it, they're done. In fact, one of our employees spent three months without any project management experience before, spent three months on this learning management system. And at the end of three months was CAPM certified. So go to the website, look for this particular course, it does say PMP exam prep camp 2018, but it's really more of a CAPM exam. Um, CAPM and PMP as well. So you can see when you get to the page, it says PMP and CAPM. You see a lot of folks think the PMP is more of an elite syllabus. No, it's the same guide. It's the same guide. It's just the flavor of the exam. You know, that's different. So I would advise that you go to this site and sign up. And at least you'll be in the hands of a trainer who has done this twice, two times over. And I've also taken the PMP. So if you want to go all the way from CAPM to PMP in the next few years, this is your one-stop shop. You see a lot of people train the CAPM, but they ain't done the CAPM. 
<laughs> they ain't done it. Your buddy Phil has taken the cap M twice and has noticed what kind of exam this is. This exam is not a cakewalk. It is not by any stretch a cakewalk. Some people might want to make you think it is, but they ain't done it twice like I have. In my second exam, I remember thinking, my goodness, poor people, if they are not well directed, they could fail this thing, seriously. So I want to encourage you to, to visit that website, you know, jump on the bandwagon and let us help you um, navigate the terrain towards CAPM certification. Okay. So going back here, even if you don't have what I just showed you, the 23 hours, like I said, we can train you to get those. In fact, from our training, you're going to get 35 contact hours. And then if in the future you wanted to go off and do the PMP, you always could. All right, so that's pretty much it. Um, do you have any questions that I can answer at this time? Questions about the CAPM, gray areas. Okay, if there are no gray areas and um, what I'm showing you seems to be making sense for you, why don't we talk about the actual content for the CAPM? So let's talk about the CAPM content outline. So if you didn't know, the PMI actually has a document called the CAPM exam content outline. And I want to encourage you folks, you might want to download this, you know, download this from, from PMI's uh, website. And this will help you um, as you prepare for the exam to know what exactly you could be asked. Because it's one thing to read the PMBOK guide and think you got it down, but it's another thing to really know what the exam could be made of. Okay, so in the chat box, that way, if the Google boys haven't put me <laughs> in a mirror, a mirror situation, if you're seeing things the way they should, over there, I am going to be typing in the, um, link to this right over there over there you're going to see the link to this except the google boys will put me in the mirror image and then it's going to be over there you know it's so funny on the web you can never tell what side you're going to end up on am i going to be on the, the left am i going to be on the far left am i going to be on the far right <laughs> let's not get political here because some people don't like that all right so here is the link all right, that's the link. I've typed it in. Um, yes, I believe it is that way. <laughs> it's that way. Okay. Um, I will also put the link into a comment below. So there is the link. And um, you guys, I advise you definitely download that if you are a CAPM candidate. If you are a CAPM candidate, definitely download this thing. It is going to help you. It is going to help frame the idea of what the exam could be. But I'm going to cover it with you right now, which is helpful. So let's go along. Check this thing out. It's called the CAPM exam content outline, and it is the blueprint on which the exam is based. There's an introduction and a preamble, and I kind of went through some of this in the very beginning with you, but let's jump straight into what the exam will be made of. 6% of your exam is going to be from the introduction to project management. What do they want you to do? They want you to understand the five project management process groups and the processes within each group. So you have five process groups in project management, initiating, planning, executing, monitoring and controlling and closing. And the mnemonic for this is, I prefer eating mangoes chilled, okay? The next thing they say is recognize the relationships among 
project program portfolio and operational management. So let's backtrack here so I can do this justice. Five project management process groups. The processes within each process group, they are two within initiating, 24 within planning, 10 in executing, 12 in monitoring and controlling, and one in closing. Two, 24, 10, 12, one. Now you have to know these 49 processes. The page in the PMBOK guide is page 25. You gotta know them. You gotta be able to dump page 25 down as proof that you really know it, all right? So be able to do that. Um, I've gone through countless videos, countless, countless videos on this channel to underscore the 49 processes. In fact, I'm gonna type this in for you just so that you've got it. So I think the video is, of course it's in the Prazion channel, 49 processes of project management. If you go to youtube.com forward slash Prazion and you look under the Pembok Guide 6th edition videos it is right there. In fact, I'm going to type the link in just to make sure you don't start scrambling around looking. So if you look over there, you'll see it. Okay, so I've just typed it in that way. And I am also going to put it in the comments just to make sure you guys don't have to scramble around looking for it. So I'm gonna put a second comment down below and for anyone getting ready for the cap them to really understand what this content outline is talking about just check out my video seriously that video is very very straightforward um, it will be hard to miss what i'm talking about there all right so that is 1.1 1.2 recognize the relationships among pro project program portfolio and operational management. Let me give you the skinny of it. A project is a singular endeavor. It has a beginning and an end, and it's meant to deliver a deliverable. A program is a collection of two or more interrelated. Do not miss this word, interrelated. There are two projects that are related Okay, so a program is a collection of projects, two or more projects that are interrelated and programs are managed in a coordinated fashion by a program manager. And the reason is there's some overarching benefits from delivering the projects in the program. If you just deliver one of the projects, it doesn't give you the full benefit. For example, a hardware project, on its own, it's okay, but it doesn't really give you the full benefit unless you've got software to run with it. A software project A, hardware project B, and let's talk about the integration project C. When all of those projects A, B, and C, which are interrelated, of course, are managed as a program, you get the full benefit of managing those projects in a coordinated fashion, and you also get control of resources that may be used across the different projects. So that's really what a program is at a high level, a portfolio. A portfolio is a collection of projects, programs, and operational work. In fact, all the endeavors being performed by a business unit, by a company, by an entity, you could refer to them as a portfolio. Operational work is repetitive work that sustains the business. And the PMI, of course, wants you to know that. So define a typical project life cycle. So there's a term that the PMI used, project life cycle. A project life cycle is a collection of phases that characterize that particular project. You could have life cycles from software development, or you could have a life cycle for building a building or for even baking a cake. But when you hear the term 
project management process groups, those would be what I just talked about, initiating, planning, executing, monitoring and controlling and closing. It is the cycle of life of managing a project. That is also called a project management life cycle, but it is not the same as this. This thing right here called the project life cycle refers to the technical work being done. And the nature of these life cycles are talked about in the PMBOK guide. You've got different project life cycles. And these project life cycles could be described in different ways. So if you do have a copy of the PMBOK guide, I want to encourage you to take a look at some of these things. Maybe you're in the elementary stage of your PMP prep, your CAPM prep, I beg your pardon. This will boot you into the fast lane of understanding what exactly um, the CAPM exam is all about. So that is pretty much it for 1.3. And the last one, understand the function and importance of tailoring. This is also talked about in the PMBOK guide. And I was quite happy that they talked about this early in chapter one, because tailoring is on 1.2.5 in the PMBOK guide. So if you go to section 1.2.5, you see they talk about tailoring. And tailoring just means you can't apply the entire PMBOK guide in parrot fashion to your project. You should tailor it. You should. So tailor how you apply the PMBOK guide. The way you run projects could differ. You could run projects in a fully plan driven way, planning out everything, you know, because the project is very clear up front, or you might need to be agile, as we call it. And you'll learn a little bit more about agile if you do stay stuck on the PMBOK guide and the agile practice guide. Just another caution there is agile, there is an agile possibility on the CAPM, even on the CAPM. All right, so that's one. So let's go through the rest and I'll do this very quickly. Now you kind of get the idea about where all this is going. So looking at chapter two, talks about the project environment. Think about it like the environment in which projects operate. Think about it like that. Projects operate in an environment within the firm. The firm is in a larger environment within a geographic location. And that is also in a wider environment of a state or country. But when you think about the smaller environment within a company, various things influence projects, various things influence how projects are birthed and how they're managed. So it says, identify the factors and assets that may impact the outcome of a project. What could influence a project and its outcomes? That should be a no brainer. The way an organization is set up, the way it's led, its governance, the project manager's authority, the project manager's style, things like that. Distinguish between organizational systems. Now, this is a big topic in chapter two and to, to really get good with this, you're just gonna have to read it. You know, it says projects operate within constraints imposed by the organization through their structure and governance framework. And then it goes further to say the system factors, system factors in an organization are management elements, governance framework, and organization types. And it gets really deep and detailed. Talking about governance framework, it talks about rules, policies, procedures, relationships, norms, systems, and so on. Talking about management elements, it talks about how people are disciplined in a firm, unity of direction, unity of command, authority given to perform work and so on. And then talking about organizational structure types, we go into the different organizational structures. And this talks about organic, simple, functional, multi-divisional, so on and so forth. I'm actually on page 47 if you were following in the PEMBA guide, but all that stuff has to be understood. This is a little bit gray, but the bottom line is you need to be solid in chapter two or you will get lost. 
So you need to be solid where those systems and management elements and organizational structures and so on and so forth are talked about. Understand the purpose and activities of the PMO, the project management office. There are three types of PMOs. And these are spoken about on page 48. You've got supportive, controlling and directive PMOs and in economies of control, directive are uh, those with the highest degree of control. Uh, supportive just gives you support. And by the way, PMO is the acronym for that project management office. All right, next one is recognize the hierarchy of projects, programs, and portfolios. So in economies of scale, portfolios are the big P's of everything you're doing. Within a portfolio, you've got programs and projects. And you've also got an image for this in chapter one. They mentioned it in chapter two, but I think it's chapter one, you've got a table that kind of breaks this down. This table is on page 13 and it's called comparative overview of portfolios, programs and projects. So if you know that table well, it will serve you well on the exam. All right, let's go into chapter three now. So in chapter three, the role of the project manager, by the way, this is my favorite chapter because it really breaks down for you what the project manager does in the firm, what the project manager should be doing. So the primary functions of the project manager are talked about here. Um, the project manager's sphere of influence is talked about here as well. And to really get a, a good grasp of this, I'll just give you some visuals about the project manager's sphere of influence. This is on page 53, but I also like to think about it like this. You got the PM in the middle and the PM influences in layers. You've got another layer there, which could be looked at as the project team, the program team, the portfolio team, see, resource managers as well. Then you've got another layer on the outside, which will be more of higher level individuals, governing bodies, steering committees, and so on. And then you've got a much wider band out there of various stakeholders who may be very much involved in the project or just informational type of stakeholders. You've got the customer, you've got the supplier, you've got end users and so on. So the project manager influences in these different capacities. The PMI wants you to know that. That is on page 53 in the PMR guide. Also the talent triangle, which is one of PMI sacred cows. This is on page 57. So the talent triangle is pretty much this. The dogma is the project manager should be capable in technical project management. And technical project management doesn't necessarily mean being an IT or engineer, and it just means the nuts and bolts that make project management really tick, which will be more like the triple constraint of scheduling, costing, and scoping out the project. So the project manager should be technically capable. The project manager should also be a leader in his or her own right. And last but not least, the project manager should have business acumen. We, we call that strategic and business management. So that is your talent triangle. And PMI want you to know that for, for the CAPM exam. And then one of my favorites, the last one here, it says, what is the difference between leadership and management? So on page 64, this has got to be one of the things you look at. So management, direct, direct people, use positional power, leadership, guide people, influence and collaborate. I think all this is summed up in a, in a saying by the great Steve Jobs, which is management is making people do what you want them to do or what you think they should do, to paraphrase in. 
And then he goes further to say leadership, on the other hand, is making people do what they never even imagined they could accomplish. By the time you take a team member from I can't to, wow, what did I just do? See that seismic shift, beating people over the head with a stick versus freeing people's minds to do the impossible. You know, Steve talks about a particular situation that happened where he told an employee to get something done, create software that can make rounded edges. And this was early day. I can't remember which version of the apples they were working on or the Macs they were working on. But this person said, no, there's no way I can get this done. And Steve said, wait, you need to get this done. This is like the holy grail of design. Take a look at windows of cars. Take a look at structures. You see rectangles with rounded edges, rectangles with like semicircular edges. And this guy said, I can't do it. I can't program it. And then he took him out, dragged him out and showed him around. He inspired him. He said, look, you got to do it. The guy said he can't be done. And then he came back the next day to demo what he had done. He'd done it. <laughs> that is leadership. But anyway, leadership versus management. Very big in chapter three. And honestly, that is why it's a favorite of mine because leadership is front and center. There are a lot of very interesting things in chapter three when it comes to the powers of the project manager, um, ways the project manager could leverage um, influence to get things done. It's quite an interesting read if you really read it. And it goes into other, other things in chapter three, which are not called out explicitly over here. All right, now we get into chapter four, integration management. Integration. So now we're beginning to get into the knowledge areas here. They want you to understand the seven project management processes in integration. And you already know that we've got um, develop project charter, develop project management plan, direct to manage project work, manage project knowledge, um, monitor and control project work, perform integrated change control and close project or phase. Those are the seven that you have here. So it sounded like a bunch of gobbledygook, but these are actually specific processes. These are not just some random names. These are pinpoint precise names that you must master, just like I have. 4.2, identify the input tools and techniques and outputs defined in the seven processes in project management. When PMI tell you this for the CAPM exam, better believe it. These guys ain't playing games. They'll give you questions that will make you scratch your head, even as a PMP, and say, I saw it. <laughs> I remember I saw it. Where is it? That ain't going to help you. You got to know and pinpoint precise. And you know, I'm the poster child for going into exams without any prior planning. In fact, my Prince II exam, case in point, I decided I was going to take the Prince II the day I decided I was going to take the Prince II. The day I discovered I could take the Prince II exam in the comfort of my home was the day I decided I was going to take it. I did a 30 minute to one hour prep. <laughs> And boom, ace the exam. In not so different fashion, I decided I was going to take the CAPM exam while I was out traveling one time. And I thought, well, this would be a nice, fun thing to do. So I planned it, threw in my application. Within a day or two, jumped into the test center. I, I had not studied. As someone will say, but Phil, you train this stuff. It's not the same thing. Training this versus Knowing this, like cold, like I could train it if I held a PMBOK guide in my hand. I've got all the ITTOs in front of me. 
But if you're taking the exam, my friend, it changes. Seriously. Oh, dear, it does change. And that should be some caution for you folks who think, oh, it's an easy exam. It is not an easy exam. It's not. So if you cannot identify inputs, tools, techniques, and outputs from a particular process, or you get them mixed up, you say, oh, that looks like develop project charter because they'll give you a set of three or a set of two or four. And if you miss one out of the ITTOs, you could get the question wrong. They don't play games. All right, next one here is understand the purpose of project integration management and the project manager's role within it. So integration is unifying, combining, uniting project management processes, basically taking all the moving parts of project management, putting them together, making them go smooth, and uh, making sure that things happen in a, in a calculated and deliberate fashion, and they are coordinated as well. Identify concepts and procedures related to project change management. This is big, even though it has a somewhat sketchy, not in terms of um, ethics, but just spotty, I should say, account in chapter four. I think that needs to be beefed up a lot more. And I do cover this in our training, actually, but 4.5 is what they're talking about, performing a greater change control. Um, for, for the purposes of the CAPM, it should be okay, but PMPs, they find stuff that they didn't even bargain for on the exam. So this could, could do with a little bit more coverage, but in the context of the CAPM, they're really talking about section 4.5. They want you to be good in that, okay? It's not called project change management, which is why I'm stressing that it's 4.5, because if you look for project change management, it's not a process, it's not a knowledge area, it's not a process group. This is just a term that exists in this document, but it could give you concern. So just know they're talking about 4.5. It's called perform integrated change control. All right, next point here, identify tailoring consideration in project integration management and recognize key documents. So when we talk about tailoring here, in order to get the full picture of tailoring for any chapter, you just have to open up a PMBOK guide. There's no way around it, okay? This does not exist in some other body of knowledge. And anyone telling you, oh, well, it's in our study guide, they need to get real. Read the PMBOK guide. Hey, look, you want to pass the CAPM? read the PMBOK guide, seriously, read it inside out. Make sure you understand it though. And if you've got any questions about it, I want you to hit us up on this channel with a comment below saying, I don't understand this part of the PMBOK guide, okay? And in so doing, you're helping someone else. But anyway, where do you get all this stuff they're talking about? Tailoring considerations is on page 74. I'll just give you a sample of how you should attack this stuff. So where they talk about tailoring, because guess what? Tailoring is front and center. You see, they're gonna mention tailoring in quite a few of these areas. So when it comes to tailoring for integration on page 74, it says, because each project is unique, the project manager may need to tailor the way that project integration management processes are applied. Considerations for tailoring include, but are not limited to, boom, right there. Let me tell you that phrase, that phrase needs to be looked at very carefully because PMI are fond of saying could include, but are not limited to. So that clause means anything is possible. All right, so it says, could include, but I'm not limited to, project life cycle. You need to tailor how you manage your project based on the life cycle. Development life cycle. What development life, life cycle and approach are appropriate for this product or this service? Is a predictive or adaptive approach appropriate? If adaptive, should the project, should the product be developed incrementally or iteratively, 
is a hybrid approach best? Management approaches, which management processes are most effective based on the organizational culture and the complexity of the project? Knowledge management, how will knowledge be managed in the project to foster a collaborative working environment? Change, how will change be managed? Governance, what control boards or committees or other stakeholders are part of the project? What are the project status reporting requirements? Lessons learned, which information should be collected throughout and at the end of the project? How will historical information and lessons learned be made available to future projects? And then you got benefits, when and how should benefits be reported at the end of the project or at the end of each iteration or phase? or even beyond the project. Some projects you ain't gonna get the benefit until many months after. So all of these things need to be talked about and addressed. I'm looking at page 74. And for those of you just joining, I am breaking down the CAPM exam and what exactly you need to be thinking about to be successful on it. It is not a cakewalk. So let's correct that, okay? And last but not least, it says identify methods for project integration and knowledge management. And next we go into scope management. It says understand six project management processes in project scope management. So what are the six project management processes in scope? Plan scope management, collect requirements, define scope, create WBS, validate scope and control scope. So you need to know those. These are not some made up phrases. These are really pinpoint precise. You got to know that for your exam. Identify the input tools, techniques, and outputs defined in the six processes in project scope management. You got to know the pinpoint precise unique outputs, unique inputs, inputs that make the process tick, and tools and techniques that the process hinges on largely. So if you take, for example, collect requirements, two of the major outputs from that are known as the requirements traceability matrix and requirements documentation. These are two documents that perform or are used to capture different things um, that are derived from the collect requirements process. Take, for example, define scope. That gives you a project scope statement also an important output. Look at create WBS. The output of that is the scope baseline. The tool and technique is decomposition. So these have very precise outputs, tools, techniques, inputs. And for your exam, you have to know them. You really do. Moving on, identify key concepts and tailoring. There we go again. Considerations for project scope management and key roles in scope management. And then it says, identify the purpose and elements of a WBS, a work breakdown structure, for both product and project scope. So the WBS, when it comes to what it looks like, has different looks. Sometimes people like drawing their WBSs without any graphics. So you, you kind of get something like this, like text. And then other times, you know, by the way, we call that a text-based WBS. But other times people make it look like a graphical and hierarchical looking like a family tree of sorts. So that's what a WBS is. But the PMI says, identify the purpose and elements of the WBS. Why do we need a WBS? What does it do? So on and so forth. Next one here is understand project scope management for agile, or adaptive projects, including the use of prototypes. So we're gonna cover a few more of these in greater detail, just to make sure you got your bearings. So we're looking at chapter five, follow me in your favorite book to five, Chapter five and page 100 and 133. So let's read. Now we're, we're really zeroing in to the, the one that people 
would often overlook. This one right here, the tailoring considerations. So, I mean, if cap M could have tailoring considerations, you can imagine PMPs are expected to have this in their head as well. But for cap M's to need to know tailoring considerations, that shows you the PMI are not playing games. They really want you to have the knowledge. They want, really want you to be able to demonstrate you got the knowledge, okay? That's why this is also a regarded certification. In fact, some jobs will say CAPM or PMP preferred. So it is recognized. So let's read here, page 133. It says, because each project is unique, the project manager will need to tailor the way project scope management processes are applied. And then it goes into the include but not limited to dialogue. So it says, what should you be considering here to tailor? One, knowledge and requirements management. Two, validation and control. Three, development approach. Four, stability of requirements and five governance. Let's read these in more detail. It says, knowledge and requirements management. Does the organization have formal or informal knowledge and requirements management systems? Does your company have a formal knowledge management system? One of my clients says, Phil, we've got one, but we don't use it. <laughs> You're in trouble. You got a system, you don't use it. Yeah, no one likes SharePoint here. Those folks need to get with the program. If that's what you have, it needs to be used. But that is one of the considerations. Do we have a knowledge management system? Do we have a requirements management system? What guidelines should the project manager establish for requirements to be used in the future? Validation and control. Does the organization have existing formal or informal validation and control related policies, procedures, and guidelines? Some organizations are loosey-goosey. Anything goes. If you don't have control, you need to build control. Development approach. Does the organization use agile approaches in managing projects? Is the development approach iterative or incremental? Is a predictive approach used? Will a hybrid approach be productive. So you need to think about these as a PM. Stability of requirements. Are there areas of the project with unstable requirements? Do unstable requirements necessitate the use of lean, agile, or other adaptive techniques until they are stable and well-defined? Governance. Does the organization have formal or informal audit and governance policies, procedures, and guidelines? I find a lot of companies out there, they got zero, zero in terms of control. And let me just say management is as guilty in pandering to these half-baked project managers that do not want any control. No, we want to do it whatever we like. We want to use the tools however and whenever we like. That's no good. If you are a PMO director, PMO leader, you better get your people some control because where there is no control, people run amok, projects go to the dogs. This stuff I'm showing you folks, it may seem simple, but it's very, very difficult for many companies to apply. A lot of people, they don't apply this stuff. They know it, but they don't apply. They allow people to get away with Project murder, to be honest. But anyway, I'm going to get off my soapbox for now. That is pretty much it for today. Tomorrow, we will get together and talk about the other chapters in the content outline. It's an ongoing journey. So you see, we've spent some significant amount of time. This stuff takes time to talk about, even in the world of CAPM. Okay? Now, if you've got any questions based on anything I shared tonight, I would like you to ask the questions right now. But if you don't have any question, I'll just say, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to hit like so that your friends know this is out there. Share it on social media. Don't keep it a secret because if you do, less people will know about this. And this could help folks. All right. So I want you to share it. Take to LinkedIn. Take to Twitter. Take to Facebook. Let those taking the cap them know they've got help. When I took my exam, there was no help.
it was quite a journey for my PMP exam, that is. I took my CAPM after I took the PMP. But anyone trying to take the CAPM needs help. I mean, they're new to this stuff. They're green, most likely. All right, so questions, concerns, comments. Or if you want to gripe about your journey, I also work as a shrink, <laughs> a PMBOK shrink. If you got any questions, I'll answer them now. If you don't, well, I just want to say a massive thank you to you for joining me. Thank you all very much. And I wish you all the best in your CAPM journey. Don't forget to visit www.prazion.com. That's P-R-A-I-Z or Z-I-O-N.com. And sign up for that training that we've got for people taking either the PMP or the CAPM. Like I said, it's this over here. You click on that button. It takes you to the page where you can sign up. At the moment, we have this course going for $99. This is not going to hang around. It's a one-week access. And also, the one-month access is also reduced. It's typically $175. So if you want to jump on the bandwagon, do it now, because it won't stay this way forever. All right? Thank you all very much. I appreciate you joining. And I look forward to speaking to you tomorrow. Hey, don't forget, subscribe so that when I am online, you will receive a notification. All right? Thank you. Bye for now. See you tomorrow.